Well, good evening. Um, I thought that instead of me tonight, I'd let you listen to two sermons from what became the annual meeting of Arkansas Baptist this year. So you're going to hear uh, President of Arkansas Baptist, uh, Dr. Manley Beasley Jr. from over at Hot Springs Baptist Church for a, a few minutes. And then you'll hear the Executive Director of Arkansas Baptist, Dr. Sonny Tucker, um, share with us some insight from Scripture. And the other thing that you'll get is uh, Dr. Paul Chitwood, who is the President of the International Mission Board. Uh, you'll hear a brief report from him on our work in uh, international missions as Southern Baptist. But I encourage you to take a listen and pay attention. This is part of what we are a part of as Arkansas Baptist. So uh, I was deeply challenged by these, these three men and some of the other reports. And I think that you will also uh, benefit from hearing them. So take a listen, enjoy, and uh, we'll see you Sunday morning. Don't we? I don't know how many people uh, we have conversations with and the conversation moves in the direction of would you ever have believed a year ago even that we would be where we are today. Uh, trying to do God's work at a distance, that's a, that's a new one for us, isn't it? Um, divided nation, uh, higher level of antagonism toward us who call ourselves by Christ's name. I think we can agree that that's happening around us. Um, but just so you're aware, Paul experienced social distance. Paul faced intolerance, not just by one group, but by multiple groups. His Jew, the Jews, Gentiles, all of them, the Romans. Uh, he experienced everything we're experiencing thousands of years ago. You want to try some social distancing, go to prison for a few years, right? There's nothing that he experienced in ministry. There's nothing that we experience right now in ministry that Paul did not have to deal with. Isn't that interesting? And yet his attitude was so different than ours. Not that he didn't get discouraged from time to time. He records that for us. But I do think that he has a word for us today based out of that experience. And so we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, a very familiar passage as we ask God for a word from his word. You don't need a word from me. You need a word from the Lord, just like I do. All right? Philippians 3, 12 through 16, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. What I'm going to suggest to you this morning is that the Word of God tells us that there are opportunities created in circumstances such as we find ourselves that we will never experience again in our lives. And so it becomes timely. It becomes an issue of us discovering what it is that God has for us at this moment in time that we must learn. And there are things that we share in that, and then there are things that are very personal and unique to each of us. Today, since I'm speaking to you as a group, I'm going to focus on those things which we share that we must do in the context of the circumstances we are in. First of all, I'm going to suggest to you, based on this passage, now is the time for us to reevaluate. Reevaluate. As an individual, as a church, as a convention, as a national convention. I'll, I'll take it on further. Now is a time for us to reevaluate. The circumstances in which we are living today, we don't know how far they're going to go, how much longer they're going to last, so we must make the adjustment. Amen? Everybody's praying for revival in my church. Everybody's praying for revival across the nation. What I'm concerned about is the revival we're praying for is that we go back to the way it was, and that's not what God wants from us, folks. That's not what He wants. We must reevaluate. He says, not that I've already obtained it, or have already became per perfect. Paul understood, and he's writing this from prison. He's been around the block a few times, and he's saying, I'm not there yet. There's still more to learn, and we need to acknowledge that. Two questions must be asked. One is, what must we accomplish in this moment? We have to seek God's will and direction. What must we accomplish in this unique moment? 
many of you know, some of you may not know, uh, the evangelist who's passed away, Mike Gilchrist. Mike Gilchrist was my uncle. And uh, when I took my first pastorate, he told me, there are some things that can only be done in your first year. Make sure you do them or they'll never get done. Now, we call that the honeymoon stage. So he knew what he was talking about, right? But he said that there are some things that must be done in this moment in time that will never be done if we don't do them. We must seek God diligently and discover what it is as a convention, since I'm speaking to you on that level. But that's also personal, and it's also instructive for us as pastors, leaders, ministers, and even in our own home. Would you agree? So we find ourselves... Seeking God, what is it that we must accomplish before this opportunity is lost? But there's another issue here. There are some things we must abandon now. One of the interesting things that's happening in our church is that there are a lot of things that we haven't been able to do. I'm going to suggest to you there may be a few of those that we don't need to ever do again. Amen? As a convention. We are, we are carefully, as a part of the executive committee, which all of you who are here and many of you online would find yourselves in, we are, like I've never seen before, we are seeking God diligently about what we are about. Amen, Brother Sonny? Amen? We are, I've, I've been in all these committees he listed and all this stuff. I've never seen anything like the heart and the commitment of men and women just like you to say, we need to know what God wants us to do and what he doesn't want to do, we need to forget about and move on. Is that what he said? He said, we need to move forward. Forget about what lies behind. Reach forward. We got to let go. We don't go back. We forget what lies behind. We move ahead. Amen? So, we need to reevaluate. Secondly, I'm going to suggest to you that God's Word suggests to us that now is the time for us to rededicate. You know... You remember back when we were a kid, they always, part of the invitation was always rededicate. And then it got kind of a bad, I, th I guess it got a bad name. We don't use that word anymore. Rededicate. You know, yeah, well, he came down, he rededicated. You know. uh, we, we don't do that. I got news for you, folks. I rededicated when I was growing up, okay? I was raised in, a, uh, in a, the home of a pastor, and the invitation was given, and when God spoke to my heart, and the guy said rededicate, if I didn't know what else to do, I went down there. It showed a heart and a desire and a passion for the things of God. What's wrong with rededicating, amen? Now, I will say this. If you want to know a more biblical concept of what the Word has to do, I'm just going to say, Get, get back to the cross. Rededication is getting back to the cross, and I have to do that consistently and persistently in my experience. It's a place of death. The dedication is that consecration that takes place when we put ourselves on that altar, when we make the choice, once again, to die. And Paul said he did it pretty frequently. How about daily? Maybe we need to wake up every morning and rededicate. Maybe we need to wake up every morning and place ourselves back on that altar of sacrifice and say, God, not me. Not my will. Thine be done. How do you do that when things get tough? How do you deal with what we're, we're, we're messing with here? Remember your calling. Remember your calling. Have you ever wanted out? If you're in ministry and you've never wanted out, you just haven't been there long enough. <laughs> but we can't quit. Why? Because we didn't volunteer. We were called by God himself. We are compelled to die if necessary. But I got news for you. As someone who apparently uh, should be dead by now, bypasses, diabetes, is bad, all kinds of junk. Sometimes it's harder to live for Christ than it is to die for him. Now I know that sounds, you say, well, yeah, none of us have really faced death. But in the circumstances we find ourselves in, we may be called very soon to make a stand for what we believe, and we're going to have to live for him. Remember that you were called by God. But also, we need to remember our priority, not just that to doing that for which I was laid hold of, but also, Paul says, this one thing I do. Just because we're facing different circumstances doesn't mean that our number one priority has changed, has it? Do you, ever, do you ever think that God's up in heaven right now wringing his hands? The COVID's destroying ministry. 
How am I going to reach the world with all of this mess that's going on now? We need to get back to that which is the priority that we were given from the very start. Let's go back to doing that for which we were laid hold of. Paul even made this statement. He said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We have to come to that place again and be reminded, I can't quit because I didn't start this thing. God did. So we rededicate ourselves. We renew our commitment to him. We, we refire, if that's what you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. My point is this. It's time for us to re-accelerate. This is the moment in time where you and I ask God for the divine wisdom that we need. Is that what we need? Divine wisdom and how are we going to reach others? How are we going to minister in the context we're in with the expectation that God will do greater things in our midst now than he's ever done before? We're already making excuses for why our numbers are down, our giving's down, our attendance is down. I see people, well, I'm not coming back to church as long as I have to wear a mask. Move to China and see what it takes to get to church. Wearing a mask, they'd love to switch out with you. Oh, you, all you got to do is wear a mask? <laughs> I'm in, man, let's do it. We are called to go harder than ever before. I press on. I like what the old preacher said. I ain't looking back. I ain't holding back. And I definitely ain't going back. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hey, say it with me. I'm going to say it. We ain't looking back. Let's say it. We ain't looking back. We ain't holding back. Say it. We ain't holding back. And we ain't going back. We ain't going back. Sorry, all you people who love good English. Just got you to do it. We are called to go higher, not just to go harder, but we're called to go higher than we've ever been. I press on toward the goal of the prize of what call? The upward call. It's a call upward, y'all. We are called to go upward. We are called to walk a narrow path. I've always said that path isn't just narrow, it's upward. The crowd goes with gravity. If you look on that path, if you look up, it goes, if, if you look up, it's narrow, it's winding, it's difficult. Is that what the Bible says? It's a narrow path. It's a diff you look that way, and after a little ways, it becomes paved, and then it becomes wider, and then all the masses in the crowd, they're just all following the gravity of sin. When you're born in this world, you're going downhill with the rest of the crowd. And if God doesn't touch your life and change your life and turn you around, You'll keep going. You'll keep following the flow, the natural flow of lostness until you wind up in hell. We've got to be the examples. We've got to be the leaders. We've got to call people to go higher than they've ever gone. Colossians 3.1, if you then have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Aren't you glad that the Bible doesn't give every little detail of what we do? Or we will be just like the Pharisees. We'll be squabbling, and we're doing it enough anyway, but we'll be squabbling, and we're every little decision, making everything. He says, just keep looking up. Is that something we can agree on? You know, we can find plenty to disagree about. But how about this? Let's keep looking up. So what's the word for us today? I'll tell you what the word is, Arkansas Baptist. When the going gets tough... We press on. On behalf of the International Mission Board, I want to thank your convention for partnering with the IMB. For 175 years, IMB has served Southern Baptists in an effort to get the gospel to the nations. Thank you for providing for nearly 3,700 IMB missionaries through your cooperative program and Lottie Moon Christmas offering gifts. Your faithful financial support and unwavering prayer support are the lifelines for Southern Baptist International Missions. Throughout our 175 year history, Southern Baptists have maintained an uninterrupted witness among the nations. In spite of famines, wars, civil unrest, and even as we have experienced this year, pandemics. This commitment has not come without sacrifice by your missionaries and their continued witness cannot continue without your sacrificial support. 
Last year, Southern Baptist gave over $157 million to support international missionaries in the third highest Lottie Moon offering ever received. IMB also received just over $99 million through the cooperative program, and that's the third consecutive year that CP giving top $99 million for IMB receipts. In recent weeks, we've heard new reports of how your Southern Baptist missionaries continue to be a part of God's work on the international mission field, where more than half a million people heard a gospel witness last year, resulting in nearly 90,000 new believers. Has everyone heard? No, everyone has not yet heard. We know that every second, two people die without knowing Christ. We know that 25% of spoken languages do not have scripture to share the gospel in their heart languages. And that is why Southern Baptist, your IMB is still sending your missionaries. And these faithful workers are still sharing the gospel wherever the Lord places them. Uh, whether in a temporary location due to COVID-19 or through new digital channels during a lockdown, Praise God, the gospel is advancing. And you're a part of this eternal work through your giving, your praying, your sending, and your going. Every church, regardless of its size or resources, has a part to play in reaching every nation with the gospel. And the nations are waiting. Thank you for doing your part. decided that we needed to remodel the kitchen and uh, I didn't I didn't say anything for fear of life and limb I thought the old kitchen was okay but I said okay and we weren't gonna do a lot just a, really a little bit it took longer than we thought than I thought it was more messy than we thought how in the world every day you come in and there's strangers in your home you don't even know and uh, they look at me like you're in the way <laughs> you know I'm looking at them like I own, I'm paying you I own this place how do you get sawdust everywhere? Why do you let the cat in every day? Can you not keep the cat from running in the house? And so it was really laborious. It was a never ending nag. It was very inconvenient. It was tiring. The system was a very, the process was a never ending nag. That's understand what I said there. <laughs> and, uh, but once the, once the, remodel was done it was really great and you look now you see the new cabinet covers and the things that are wonderful so you think about what we're going through with this uh, pandemic and how we've impacted manly had some incredible things to say about that you really did and i'm going to pick you back a little bit on what you shared i think we're going to remodel if you think about the attitude and the heart we should have we should be very positive about this time you know, we have prayed for a long time. God sent a revival. God sent an awakening. God, help us to break these old molds, these old traditions that are killing us. Help us to help our folks get out of just being program-based. Help our folks to just quit basing Christianity on whether or not you show up at church on Sunday. Help our folks to be engaged. And I think God has said, okay, I've heard your prayers. I'm going to answer your prayers. But if you want to remodel, then we're going to move all the furniture out for a while and we're going to get sawdust everywhere and we're going to, you're going to have to get tired and your people are going to have to get tired and you're going to have to understand that there's a whole lot that goes into the beautiful, wonderful facelift that we're going to give, but you've got to go through this process. Folks, I totally believe we asked for this and I totally believe God has responded. Whether you're strongly reformed or moderately reformed or you're a traditionalist like me, we have one thing in common. We believe in God's sovereignty and we believe God's timing is perfect and we believe that God's love is never ending and we believe that God really, really cares and wants to do a great work. We all agree on that. So as we are right in the middle, hopefully we're in the middle, maybe we've passed the hump, Two, two actions that I think we ought to have. First is a heart action, and the heart action is I think we need to be extremely positive about where we are and what's going on. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. How many times have we preached this verse? And so now we're going through the challenges and it is difficult and it's not fun and it seems to be never ending and it's very tiring. But I will promise you, God is at work. He is doing a wonderful and an incredible thing. We need to embrace this moment being very strategic. Like Manley said, some things God is allowing to die. You've been praying for years. God, would you please let this die? And I wouldn't dare call anything out for fear of life and limb at this moment. But there are some things that you said, Lord, we really need to change. We need to really, really need to modify. We should be more strategic. And I think that's exactly what God is doing. But first is the sawdust. And first is the furniture moved out. And first is the disruption of life. And first is the constant, never-ending nag and things not being right and things being dirty. And the cat running in the house and things not being in order like they should. First, before you ever, you ever get to the beautiful end product of the remodel. A few months ago, we were working with an incredibly challenging situation with a church. It's heartbreaking. Uh, we always keep it private. It's what we're here to do is serve. What we're here to do is to help. And we want to do the best we can to be one of God's instruments in a case like this to turn muddy water into lemonade. Someone made this comment, someone from out of state, oh, I just hate that y'all are having to deal with this. I hate that y'all are going through this. I thought about it in a moment. I usually don't respond, but I did respond because this is a dear friend, and I felt like I can say this. I rejoice that we get to deal with this. What are we supposed to do? This is God's church. This is some great people. Things are not as they should be, but is there some way to salvage some of this? It, isn't it great that God gave us this opportunity to step in? And we were in a room with David and Marcus and Greg and talking through this thing. And we talked about this further. Isn't it great that God called us and gifted us and gave us the ability to walk with someone and love someone, to speak truth and, and also encouragement? I, I, what, what greater honor could we have that day and for that couple of weeks to really get to help a congregation going through a horrible time? What, what greater thing could we do? I mean, I'm, I'm okay if we go fishing. I'm okay if we play golf, but I can't, I can't live on fishing and golf when we get to serve the church. Now, you think about this. I want you to embrace this moment. God knows exactly what's going on, and, and you are a leader that he has gifted, and he has called, and he has enabled you to lead your congregation and lead your folks through this time. We have some of the greatest women leaders in this state in this room and joining by zoom you have some of the greatest men some of the greatest deacon that's ever existed in the state of arkansas in this room and watching by zoom and some of the greatest pastors and staff isn't it great that god gave us this time in life that we could walk through this with a church in a difficult time i mean what what, what else could we want manley's right if we were in china be incredibly difficult I heard Paul Chitwood share the other day personally about some of our men and women in places that we can't even talk about and some of the challenges they're going through and 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 some of the difficulties in ministry and so we just have sawdust <laughs> you know we just have the furniture out of place uh, we hadn't had to leave family and friends and pets and we had not had our life totally turned upside down. And I know it's difficult. But let me tell you about you. God called you and he gifted you and he placed you exactly where you need to be right now. So I ask you and I ask me to understand the wonderful, incredible, powerful God that's in charge of the timeliness and exactly what he's trying to do and embrace the moment. I'm very, I've always had a challenge personally to look at, run fast and look ahead. And I'm learning the last few years to stop and say, 
this moment, God, this moment, help me to stop and live in this moment and not just look ahead. In fact, Will, the other day, you were coming in the office to talk to us about something, and I prayed before you got to the office, Lord, hadn't got to talk to Will in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to have about 30 minutes with Will. Help me to stop thinking about where we're going today and where I'm going after the meeting with Will and what I've got to get done. I need to spend 30 minutes focused on Will. We're so excited that Will's here. He's brought Will to us. Will deserves my time and my attention and my intensity of focus for this time. Your congregation and your family and your church members deserve the intensity of your focus and your love and your positive attitude as they go through this time. And you trust God that when all the sawdust is cleaned up and the furniture is put back, he has made a new room of ministry for us in which to work. Let's embrace this moment with a hard attitude of being positive. And let's make sure this moment counts. Second thing we do, understand that even though God is at work, this is still a very difficult time for a lot of folks. Galatians says this in chapter 6, verse 2. I, I remember when I was a, a, a young teenager reading the passage, I didn't understand it. He said in chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens. And then he said, verse 5, each of you shall bear his own burden. I thought, that doesn't make sense. Well, of course, when you get down and you study the language, you understand this. He said, each one shall bear his own load, his own burden. That's the idea of a backpack. Folks, everybody's got a backpack that you have to carry. We can't carry your backpack for you. You've got to carry it. It may be heavy at times. It may be cumbersome. It may be uncomfortable. And sometimes your backpack is more discomfort at a discomfort level than others but you have to carry your own backpack that is your job that's your responsibility God works in your life to do that and so I have a backpack to carry and you do too but there's another verse the one before that says bear one another's burdens and that's the idea of a ship's cargo we all can't unload a ship's cargo by ourselves we have to have help with a ship's cargo I want you to know that I'm not sure that I've seen a time in the life of the convention, our convention of churches, that this many pastors and staff feel like that they've got a ship's cargo that they're trying to unload and they're overwhelmed. I don't think I've had this many connections to pastors and staff that feel overwhelmed like right now. I'm commanded by the love of Christ and by the word of God if you have a ship's cargo and there's more than one person can carry to help you carry that load, what I want you to do is be so sensitive to those pastors and staff around you, those church leaders, and help them carry their load. Would you ask the Holy Spirit, I mean, really, literally, I mean, really, would you ask the Holy Spirit in this moment to bring faces to your mind that he says, I want you to help them carry this load. Holy Spirit's our partner. He's our friend. He walks beside us. He speaks in our ear. He gives us guidance. He brings thoughts. I'm trying my best to learn to hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I miss it because I want the loud voice. Let the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit show you someone, maybe a friend, maybe someone you don't know that well, that you, you don't have to know that they're carrying an incredible load. He knows. And he puts their face in your mind. And would you have an action plan that you can connect with them and help them carry their load? I will tell you, I'm not sure I've seen a time when this many of our great, great men and women are carrying a load like this. I want you to make sure you stay close to the agency institution leaders. We remarked a few moments ago, are you aware of the connection these agency and institution leaders have to you, your churches, and each other? Isn't that a blessing? Folks, that's incredible. These are some of the greatest men I know. And you've picked up enough from these men sharing this morning that they're carrying a ship's cargo. You need to connect with them. You need to connect with them personally. You can send them an email. You can talk to them when you can catch them. You need to pray for them. They have challenges. Get behind these folks. I'm so proud of what we have in this state. I'm so proud that when you start talking about cooperative program missions, you can change it when you get ready to change it because the churches of this convention drive what we do, the messengers and annual meeting. But so much of your quarter program missions invest in the next generation. Oh, my goodness. I mean, from Camp Salon 
from the work of the executive board on what happens at Williams and at Washita and what happens with the children's home and how the foundation funneled so much money there. It's incredible that we invest so much in the next generation. And then what we do internationally. We do a lot of stuff with all different age groups, but we're very heavily focused on that. We've had a challenge this year. CP is up. I mean, we've been running about 101, 102% of budget. Uh, thank you for staying with us on that. It looks like the special offerings have a challenge, the special offerings that depend on the giving in churches. Uh, we're going to take a pretty good hit with Dixie State Mission offering, it looks like. I'm not going to complain. If you give $10 and that's all the whole state gives to Dixie Jackson State Mission Arm, I will thank you for $10. And I'm going to mean it with every fiber of my heart. Thank you for what you're doing. Whatever and however much you give us, we will adjust. and We will serve God gladly with great thankfulness. But be very cognizant of the special offerings. Lottie is good. Annie is taking a hit. You do what you can. Stay with us. Thank you for being a cheerleader and a part of that. But by all means, stay together. Would you think about your pastors and your staff, your friends, folks in your church that are battle fatigued, and they feel like I'm at the end of my rope. They feel like I've been unloading this ship's cargo for so long, and my back is tired, and my brain is fogged, and I'm just exhausted. When people are exhausted and they're drained, that's when they don't make good decisions. That's when they don't speak with wisdom and caution. And that's when their emotions are frayed. And that's many times when they're most vulnerable to carelessness that Satan steps in and takes advantage of. Start in this room today. Would you love on the folks around you today? When you go back home, would you ask the Holy Spirit, your great friend, to show you faces of folks? You don't need any information other than the Holy Spirit gave you their face. And let them know that you are praying for them. And would you please carry our dear brothers and dear sisters who do so much for us. Carry them during this difficult time while God is reshaping and giving us a new day. New day to do incredible ministry. Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts as we leave. Show us what you want us to do. It is challenging, and I think we're all fatigued. Lord, you're doing a new work, and we're just in that remodel process that's very challenging. But Lord, in the process, we have folks that they're carrying their own backpack, and I can't care that for them. We're not even asked to do that. But they have a ship's cargo. Show us, Holy Spirit, these wonderful men and wonderful women and how we can share a word of encouragement, help carry that load. Lord, you've given us great officers in this state convention to serve us. I love the system that we're driven by the churches. You give us leaders who coordinate and serve. Thank you for the officers that you've given us, and in a moment we're going to honor them. So thank you for today and what you've done in Christ's name. Amen.